So let's see what this is asking. Um, a ball of mass m and radius r1 on the end of a t massless solid is rotated in a horizontal circle of radius r0 about an axis of rotation AB. It's shown on here. <clears throat> Considering the mass of the ball to be concentrated at its center of mass, calculate its moment of inertia about AB. Okay, I think this one, I would do something like that. Uh, let me know if I miss anything, but I think A, so it says the mass is concentrated at its center of mass, like here, which is the center of mass. And this rod is massless, so we don't have to worry about that. The only thing is this blue ball. And we are to calculate its moment of inertia about, about here. I would say, okay, moment of inertia is, let's first write the definition. It's like sum of all um, mi r i squared, sum of all i's. But in this case, there's only one i and it's concentrated in the center. So I would say this is going to be equal to uh, m times, and the distance is r not squared. Right? So that one was easy using the parallel axis theorem and considering the finite radius of the ball, calculate the moment of inertia of the ball about AB. Okay. So B, first, let me uh, remind you I like ball with respect to its center of mass. Okay, let me try to remember. I think it's like something like that. Two over five m r one squared. So this is the moment of inertia about its center, and the radius is r one. So I just put and the, the factor geometric factor is two over five. We can check it out if that's wrong. We can fix it, but I think it's something like that. And we are trying to find moment of inertia about axis AB. And by parallel axis theorem, it is supposed to be I center of mass plus the mass of the ball times the distance, which is R not squared. But we just found this already. This is going to be two over five m um, m r one squared plus m r not squared. So this is i sub a b. Good. Using the parallax term and considering the finite radius of the ball. Calculate the moment of inertia of the ball about AB. Yes, I think that's what it is. And C, so calculate the percentage error introduced by the point mass approximation for R1 is equal to 9.0 centimeter and capital R not is equal to uh, 1.0 meter. So I think the, I, I would say something like this. So we calculated this and we calculated this. And the question is asking how much the first one different from the second one. And I think I would do something like this. The error is, I think I would say I, A, B, minus i divided by i. Okay, let's see, let's write what this is. Generally, we show error with 
this this epsilon curly curly e and i think this is going to be equal to i sub a b divided by i minus one and i sub a b what is it sir let's calculate it here two over five m r one squared plus m r not squared divide this whole thing okay so this is i a b divided by okay this is this should be the other way around this is i a b so the the reference should be on the denominator, right? So the correct value minus the approximation divided by the correct value. Okay. So then this is going to be the other way. So this is one minus i over i a b. Good. Now I think I can get to the pet. So this is m r not squared divided by this thing. Copy, paste, cancel M, cancel M, cancel M. And I think it is something purely written in terms of uh, radius. So I think I would try it like one over two over five R1 squared over R not squared plus one. So let's calculate that is 99. Okay. So this thing turns out to be 0.996. So error is about 0.04%. We are doing two calculations, right? One calculation is like we are saying is okay. Obviously, this blue ball is not concentrated here, right? This blue ball is extended, and this extended mass is definitely not equal to it. Like, let me draw the geometry. These two things are obviously different. They are. So I say this is R not. This is M. So. If you shrink the ball, it shrinks to a point mass and this is like a different problem. But the idea is you can kind of approximate this with this because this is easier to calculate. As you see, this one took just one second to calculate. Whereas this one, we first had to remember the blue ball like sphere, which had like a complicated expression. And then we had to remember the pile axis theorem, which also had like some complication. Whereas in this, we had like one line. And when you calculate these things separately, they are different. And when people say error, error means like how much are they different? If you, I think sometimes people put absolute values not to deal with these things. If you if it bothers you, you just put absolute value because it's what matters. Okay, good. So what would I do? Um, I think I would probably, um, okay, there are different ways, but I think, um, let's see what I would do. Like, I think, let's start. So the tension here, let's let it be T. And there will be some MG. So first, I can write an equation for this. So total torque is going to be equal to moment of inertia times alpha. Torque is the tension times radius should be equal to the moment of inertia of a disc. Does anybody remember? I think it is one half m r squared, that's correct. And times 
alpha. So this is equation one. So equation two is for this guy. And this, for this guy, the equation is F is equal to M times A. And F is M G minus T is equal to M times A. Good. And there is one more condition that I need to use. Maybe somebody can tell me that. And there's one more condition that we need to use. Exactly, right? So acceleration should be equal to alpha times R. If you like, you can, this is kind of like rolling without slipping. Not exactly, but I think they are more or less the same concept. Then I think that problem is done. So let me substitute everything in that equation, or maybe I can substitute everything in this equation because we are trying to solve it for alpha. Actually, this one is easier. Let me do this. So this is mg minus the tension is, let's cancel these R's. Tension is one half m alpha. So I wrote the left-hand side. Now I want to write the right-hand side. Right-hand side is equal to m times a, but a is equal to alpha times r. So I have something with, okay, I think I forget one of the, uh, one of the r's here. So one r is gone, I forgot to write the other one. So this is m, R alpha. Good. So I can collect this term and this term on the same side. So this will give me alpha. So M times R plus one of M times HAR is also common. Let's write it outside. Your M's are same. Was it the same? Uh, the oh, M's, yeah, M's are the same too. Good, excellent. So let me fix that. This is M and this one is M. This is very convenient. So alpha times one half MR plus MR is going to be equal to three over two MR is equal to MG. Cancel M with M. All right, that's very clean equation. Alpha is equal to two over three G over R. Good. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, why didn't we consider the block when we calculate the moment of inertia? So here, okay, yeah, I think I should have made it clear. So it depends on how you look at the problem, right? I think in the lecture, I uh, calculated in a different way. I was like saying, okay, you can also do that. And I think that's a good exercise. You can say that, okay, my entire system is this. And you can do the calculation. And if you do, you do this, the moment of inertia of your system should also include this block. But here I said, okay, let me divide this system into two parts. First, let me put my system to here. And inside this red box, I have only the disk and I have the T as the external force. So T is the external force that gives us the external torque. And there's only this thing. This is one piece of problem. And I said, okay, let me take the other piece, which is here. This is the second piece of the problem. So there's like a block, there's an external force MG and there's external force T. And I put the second piece, but these two pieces are connected, right? And how are they connected? They are connected because they have the same, like uh, their accelerations are related. 
Thanks, Ajem. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Thank you for asking that. And I think um, so, sometimes, <laughs> I think uh, on Tuesday, that's what happened to me, right? Sometimes if you look at problems in different ways, your mind can get mixed up and then I oftentimes I mess up. So I have to remind myself. So maybe I, it's a good point to remind you what the subject was on Monday. I was almost forgetting that. So here, there was like a road falling, right? Uh, I think it's a good point so that I can fix what I said on Tuesday. So there was some angle and there I was saying that, okay, what is the, <laughs> what is the uh, total kinetic energy? And I was saying that there's like trans translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy, right? That I was writing is like kinetic energy translation plus kinetic energy rotation. But then the mistake there was uh, we were not constant. So this equation is valid only if you are uh, studying the center of mass. And if we were looking at the center of mass translational motion and center of mass rotational motion, this is correct. So, but we were not looking at center of mass, right? That's how I messed up. And I appreciate you guys fixed that. And later I figured that I was making that mistake. Um, that's very like, very common to fall in this pitfall. Here too, I think this is kind of related. Are you going to look at the problem from the, with like this separate masses point of view, or are you going to look at like this one piece? I think if you are interested in that picture, we also solve the problem from that perspective. You can look at the lecture notes to compare. So the problem is you have some axis like here, like this axis that stabilize that they, they have these bearings, like they, they are like pinpoints that allow rotation. And there's something like some other like rod like uh, fixed on this axis with some angle phi. Maybe I can zoom in just a little bit. Okay. So this rod is fixed on this rod and this entire thing is rotating like this. And the question is, how do you determine the total angular momentum? So for this, what we did was like, okay, so what is this mass doing? This mass is rotating like this. So what is this mass doing? This mass is also rotating like that. Okay. And the idea is, let's just freeze this picture at the moment this picture is taken. So this mass is completely on the page. This mass is completely on the page. And the velocity of this mass is out of page. But let me put it like this. This is V. And the definition of angular momentum is L is equal to R cross P, which is equal to uh, MV, like P is M times V. So I can write M outside R cross V. So I need to use right hand rule to find this R cross V. So R is this R, the distance to the uh, location of the mass. And velocity is already drawn, this, this, this thing. And now I need to calculate the, it with right hand rule. So start from here, curl your fingers toward the mass, right? And when you are on the mass, curl them towards V, which is out of page. So if you imagine doing this, like, like this, you first do this and then that out, out of the page. If you stick your thumb out, this is your L. Yeah, yeah. So here, okay, maybe I can write so it can stay. So R cross P is equal to L and P is equal to M times V. So to find the direction of L, we need to calculate some constant M R cross P. So the radius vector here, this R is here. So this R 
and uh, okay, the second one should be V. I wrote so this V. So velocity vector is here, which is out of page. Now I start with my fingers at this point, and I let my four fingers align with this one, right? Now I have the first first R. So cross with V means curl your fingers along the second V, right? I started like this, curl my fingers along the second one. So if you want your fingers, okay, maybe I can draw the hand. Your fingers first goes like that. And then they go outside the page because that's what your fingers are supposed to do. So if you like imagine aligning your four fingers like this and taking them out of the page, if you stick your thumb out, your thumb is going to be like this. If you like, this is like one, two, three, four fingers, and this is your thumb, right? And this is your arm. So torque's direction is another thing. Torque, torque, for torque, we need to take into account not angular momentum, but change in angular momentum, right? Torque is, uh, yes. so that's the difficulty with this problem. So first thing first, we determine uh, total angular momentum this way. And so the same thing with this guy, the angular momentum here, angular momentum here, total angular momentum is here. And we said that this angular momentum is, okay, these masses are rotating. This is rotating. Then this angular momentum vector is rotating. Like it's like, it's like sweeping a cone like this. We call this is processing around the axis. So think of this uh, pen like this, your angular momentum is going to be processing around axis. This is your angular momentum. And the change in angular momentum is by definition torque. And to find the torque, then we need to look at the change in angular momentum. And that's what we did. So we said, okay, let's look at this picture from the top. So let's look at this picture from the top. If you look at it from the top, so this vector has two components. One is like this, the other one is like this. This perpendicular component will be constant. It's not going to change. As it rotates, only this component is going to rotate. So I can focus on that component here. And I said, if you wait just a little bit, this component is going to be like this component. The magnitude will be exactly the same, but there will be just a little bit of angle in between these two. And that's what I wrote here. So change in angular momentum, change in angular momentum, and only the perpendicular component changes, only this component changes. So this is L times cosine pi. And amount of change is just a little bit angle, delta theta. And for delta theta, I use, okay, this thing is rotating with uh, frequency omega, then omega times t is angle. Then I can say, okay, we are trying to find torque, which is delta L delta t. Then I can take this delta t to here. Then what remains here is the torque. Right? And the direction of torque, okay, final thing, okay, the magnitude is this direction is obviously like uh, L is initially here, like maybe I can zoom it even further. L is initially here. If you wait just at an infinitesimal amount of time, it's going to be here, and then it's going to be perpendicular to L, right? Then at this moment here, torque is going to be into the page. And so final thing is, okay, these things are giving you force, right? What kind of force can give me like, okay, maybe I use another color because this, this is drawing. So this is this green into the page is torque and torque is into the page. So what kind, okay, force should be coming from somewhere. And the only possible place is these, is these bearings and I ask myself, what kind of force should these bearings give us to get this kind of torque? Obviously, point of contact is this R. So, and torque is, let me remind you, torque as a vector is R cross F. 
And you can check that, right? If you curl your fingers like this first, and then curl your fingers like this second. And if you stick your thumb out, your thumb is going to be into the page, which is exactly the torque. Then from here, we said conclude that force should be this direction because it's consistent with right hand row. In a similar way, this force should be this way. Is that clear? Thank you, Jim. I understand. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing, but I think if you just uh, think about the little bit, you get used to it. Hojam, can you repeat how you find, found the direction of the torque again? So I first found the torque from, okay, I found the torque in two ways. If, okay, let me copy these things together. So, oops, let me delete that. And let me delete that too. There are two ways I can find the torque. So one is uh, dl dt. This is kind of like Newton's equation, if you like. And I wrote it like delta L delta T. The second way is torque. It, oh, okay, these are definition vectors. The definition of torque is R cross F. And suppose we like suppose we don't know the direction of force. And we are trying to find uh, find that, right? And if I use the first condition to find the change in angular momentum. The first is like, here's my angular momentum at the point, at the time this picture is taken. And if I just wait a little bit, angular momentum will just shift a little bit, right? That's what we got because it is following this conical uh, section. And from here, I calculated this delta L. And delta L was equal to this L times cosine theta. So this is L. If you take the angle, this is like sine of this angle is cosine. And I multiply it with delta theta. And I said this delta theta is equal to omega times delta T. And from this equation, so I'm like purely looking at the angular momentum and change of angular momentum. I said, okay, then the torque should be, I take this, this delta T to here. Then I said torque should be equal to this, which is L cosine theta times omega. L cosine, uh, L cosine phi times omega. And the direction is, the direction is the direction of the change of L and the direction of change of L is like this. If you are looking from top, so if you are looking, if your eye is here, direction is into the page. Here's the, your torque. Now I have the direction of torque. I know I didn't even look at the force to know that. I just looked at the angular momentum and from that I found the direction of the torque. Now I want to ask myself, what force should be generating this angular momentum? And for that, I look at this second equation. And when you look at this picture, there's only one place that can be acting force. And these are the bearings here and here, because there's no other contact. And these bearings should be like somehow generating force. And I said, okay, let me, okay. The R for this force is known. This is R for this one. And for the other one, this is R. So this R is R. So what kind of F gives me the torque I found in the first part? And here I said, okay, R cross F. So R is this R. I started with my fingers along R. And let's say force is in that direction. And let's see if it works, he said. So I just curl my fingers like this. I curl my fingers like this. If you imagine doing this with your hand, and if you imagine sticking your thumb out, your thumb is going to be into the page. And we said, okay, this is exactly what we found in the first part. So what if there wasn't those uh, bearings that uh, implying the force? Exactly. If you didn't have these bearings, you wouldn't have this rotational motion. It, was, it would be impossible to have rotational motion without bearings. Okay. Exactly. Like after the object, uh, rotates one revolution, its angular momentum will be the same 
as previous one so we can say there is no network of course the net net torque is zero <laughs> because you are like rotating torque is like at one point okay if you are looking at that bearing from top at one point it is like this direction at another point it's this direction it's like this like this like this like this and if you like the net torque is zero i think what you mean is taking time average if you take the time average of these forces yeah it's zero but at any given moment there's like a non-zero force a non-zero torque that's absolutely true like similarly like if you think of like rotation on a circle at any given uh, moment there's like a velocity right this thing is spinning on a circle but if you sum them all sum all of them up and then average total like average velocity is zero that's the magic of rot uh, rotational motion so a 22 gram bullet strikes and becomes embedded in a 135 kg block of wood placed on a horizontal surface just in front of the gun. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the surface is 0.28 and impact drives the block at distance of 8.5 meter before it comes right. What was the modern speed of the ball? Let me try. So you have some block, some surface if you like, and you have some block like this. And there is like a bullet. And this thing moves something like this the distance is 8.5 meters so this thing is 8.5 meters so the bullet is 22 grams, the block is, so let's use little m for this, and big m for this, 1.35 kg. And the, there's a friction here. This is, New kinetic is equal to point twenty eight. All right, I think that's all we need. Then same thing, probably not. So what I would do? Okay, I'm just trying to make sure. Sometimes. You know, they hide little things there, here and there. So I would say conservation of momentum first, one. Uh, conservation of linear momentum should give us M times V should be equal to M plus M times some V prime. And from here, V prime is going to be equal to M over M plus M times V. And two, uh, conservation of energy. And I think that I would say something like that, okay. Conservation of energy. So the total kinetic energy right after the collision is one half m v squared, but one half m is m plus m, and v squared is this v squared. So this will be 
m squared over m plus m squared times v squared. And this thing should be equal to force times distance. Force is mu kinetic times mg, which is m plus mg times the distance is d. So this, this is d. Good. What you haven't we have the first kinetic energy the uh, uh, bullet sir so so initially the bullet had some kinetic energy but the collision doesn't uh, conserve it right so you need to like if you like you need to like um, puncture a hole in the block and that will generate some heat and you need to pay for that heat so kinetic energy is initially not conserved. But the total uh, momentum is conserved because there is no external force. And this puncturing hole is like an internal process. So from a momentum point of view, we are not concerned with that. But the bullet uh, is inside the block and it stopped. At that moment, we are saying, OK, that is the moment the kinetic energy conservation will start. And that's when we apply this formula. Okay. So right okay. before the code, yeah, exactly. So, and if you like, uh, let me just finalize this. I think this one will be, maybe I can cancel that one, this one. And we are trying to find the muzzle speed. And I would say this is going to be equal to V squared is equal to K M plus M squared divided by M squared. And there's like an overall factor two. Actually, let me write the others. From two, two mu g d. If you take the root, there will be square root here. This one will go. This one will go, and this one will go. I think something like that. But I didn't miss anything. But let's say that's the final speed. Right. So I th I think generally like uh, I would advise you to like you know just because book says something don't buy it right like there are sometimes typos sometimes people think differently even if I say something don't believe it I think like like you did like um, uh, Tuesday like just I think the most reliable thing is what you understand with your own uh, logic. All right, you're welcome. Um, in the pulley question that you have um, solved previously, yes, this one, you said that the, uh, the two approaches uh, might be possible. I mean, you uh, divided the system into two parts and you just thought about the pulley mm -hmm. stuff, but um, would, would the would two approaches may change the result or not? Because I'm not I sure about this. So let's see. I think we solved it in the uh, lecture in the other way. Let's see if I can find that. Or maybe I think it was a little bit different. Yeah, I think in the lecture I solved this one, right? Um, OK. <laughs> so first, don't trust that uh, I my results are correct. I think, like I said, I think on Tuesday, hopefully you learned to be uh, thoughtful, but it seems like, yes, it works both ways, right? Here, I said, this is my entire system. I said, angle, um, moment of inertia due to pulley, the mass A and mass B, that's how I calculated. And I said, this is the pulley I, there's like mass M 
And let's see if it works. Let's see if that's going to give us the same thing. So with the same logic, so the total is I, which is uh, pulley, let me put pulley, plus M times R squared. So this is the total, this is I total times alpha, right? Should be equal to torque. And if my system is this, there's only one torque coming from gravity and it should give us M times G times R. Now I sub P, we know what it is. Okay. I sub P, uh, one half M R squared. So this is going to give me three over two M R squared is equal to M G R, I forget to write alpha. So this is alpha. Cancel R's, cancel M. It seems like they are exactly the same, right? Alpha is equal to two over three, two over three, uh, G over R. And these are exactly the same. Okay, Arjun, Good. thank you. Uh, I think I'm confused, I'm sorry. Uh, now I get it. Good, great. Arjun, for the uh, previous poly question, can we divide system to the two part? Because if you try to do this, the uh, torque with respect to the center of mass of the poly, it should be zero. So I think the, you have to divide it into three parts, right? So you have to write one equation for block A, one equation for block B, one equation for the pulley, and you need to relate all the accelerations with this A, A is equal to alpha times R. And you are going to have four equations. Maybe that's why I chose it to do it this way because that would be a lot of equations. I want. I didn't want to deal with that. All right, great. So then, okay, let's finish here. I, I will see you guys next semester. I wish you good luck in your final, and I will see you in about one or two months.